welcome. Blessed be our God. Forever and ever, amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this, your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see. And that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look upon him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, as, and as one from whom others hid their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers are, is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me and are so far from my cry and from the words of my distress? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. I night as well, but I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One, enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Our forefathers put their trust in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. But as for me, I am a worm and no man, scorned by all and despised by the people. All who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips and wag their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord, let him deliver him. Let him rescue him if he delights in him. Yet you are the wounds who took me out of the womb and kept me safe upon my mother's breast. I have been entrusted to you ever since I was born. 
You were my God when I was still in my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kindred Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with the police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, And they said, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup 
that the Father has given me. So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They handed it they themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death that he would die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? 
Pilot replied, I am not a Jew, am I? You, your own nation, and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. I let asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you a king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. 
When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Kabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priest said of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus, were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother, and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to his disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because the Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. 
So they asked Pilate, have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He, he who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, lost a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with spices in linen cloths according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now, there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Hello friends, I am coming to you from Lexington because of social distancing protocols. So I'm also bringing you along on a walk. I know it's a little non-traditional for a Good Friday sermon to give it while one walks, but there's very little right now that is traditional. But as I think about the readings that we have for Good Friday, we look at the same passages each year. And each year, the same passages take on a little bit different significance to me as circumstances change. This year, Psalm 22 has particular resonance. In that psalm, the psalmist talks about feeling abandoned by God. And in a day of pandemic, it 
so, some days I feel that too. And I feel that I could even be saying uh, that psalm, especially right now in situations like this, where this is a park that's two blocks from my home. And as you can see, it's completely empty because it's closed. So normally there are kids playing, there's people on the baseball field playing tennis, and now it's totally abandoned. And even as I walk around my neighborhood, when people come toward me, they cross to, to the other side of the street. And I understand why we're doing these things. We're loving one another by keeping some distance so that we can keep each other healthy and well. And that's good. And we should be doing these things right now. But it still gives me a feeling of loneliness at times. And occasionally I can wonder, like the psalmist did, if God has given us over to this virus, if God has abandoned us during this time. But as we keep reading and come to the gospel reading for today, something really interesting jumped out at me. In John 19, when Jesus is on the cross, he looks down and sees the beloved disciple, which many scholars assume is John, and he sees his mother Mary. And Jesus looks to Mary and says, here is your son. And then he looks to John and says, here is your mother. And what a tender thing for Jesus to do. He knew that as he was dying and preparing to leave this world, that those that he loved would feel abandoned and they would need one another and they would need to feel a presence of love in their lives, in that space um, of Jesus' departure. And it's an amazing way that Jesus phrased this, though. He went to John and told John to, in essence, take his very place in Mary's life, where John was now to be Mary's son. And then he looked at Mary and said, John, uh, you are to be uh, John's mother. It's, it, it's an incredible thing that I think Jesus was calling John and Mary to be the presence of God, to be Jesus' presence to one another as Jesus was, was, was gone. It reminds me a little bit of a time when I was working at St. Matthew's. I had a writing office near Kelly's office. And one day, I think it was a Tuesday or Wednesday maybe, Kelly came to me and said, hey, would you like to take a walk? And I needed a break. And so I said, sure. And we went walking out of the church, went down Hubbard's toward uh, Brownsboro, and then made our way back to the church. And as we were walking, people would wave when they would see, I think when they saw Kelly, not really me as much, but um, people would honk in a friendly way when they passed by. And I think whether folks realized it or not, what they sensed when they saw Kelly's collar was that the presence of God was in their midst and it brought them joy and happiness. And I think, in many ways, that's what we're called to every day, but in particular now, in a day where many feel lonely and isolated, and like the psalmist are wondering, is the presence of God still here anymore? And we don't have to be wearing a collar to do that. As the prayer book says, the ministers of the church are laypersons, bishops, priests, and deacons. And the order of that is so significant, where laypersons are first in that list. And so you and I, regardless of if we're wearing a collar or not, are called by God to be the presence of Christ in this world. We can do that with something as simple as a walk and a wave to let people know that they're still remembered, there's still people out there that care about them, even if we're strangers. 
we can be the presence of Christ in one another in so many other ways. And I'm so encouraged that St. Matt's is a vibrant and very creative community of people. And so I know that you're already doing this and you're thinking of new ways to do it in the era of social distancing. But I think it's important that we keep that in mind nowadays, both for ourselves when we start feeling lonely or we start feeling that God, like the psalmist, has abandoned us. We can be mindful that God has not left, that God's presence is still with us in many ways. One of the most significant is in the presence of other people who are made in the image of God and who are called by God to be God's presence here on earth. Well, I wish you a very blessed Good Friday, and may you be the presence of God for other people. Amen.
Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that all who believe in God might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers, and the people whom they serve, for Terry, our bishop, and all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, for those about to be baptized, that God will confirm God's church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them, for Donald, the President of the United States, for the Congress and the Supreme Court, for the members and representatives of the United Nations, for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord, let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for the sick the wounded, and the differently abled, for those in loneliness, fear, and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives, and those in mortal danger, that God in God's mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of God's love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Gracious God, the comforter, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, let the cry of those in misery and need come to you, that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, 
for those who have never heard the word of salvation, for those who have lost their faith, for those hardened by sin or indifference, for the contemptuous and the scornful, for those who are persecutors of Christ's disciples, for those who in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Merciful God, creator of all peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to our God and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. Let us kneel. Let us stand. O God of unchangeable power and eternal life, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery, by the effectual working of your providence. Carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess confess that that we have have sinned sinned against you in thought, word, and and deed, by by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Savior, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Our Father, who Who art art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy thy name. Thy Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give Give us this day our our daily bread, bread, and and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And And lead us not into temptation, but but deliver us from from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead, to your holy church peace and concord, and to us sinners everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. 